Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining us today to talk about open water swimming. Thanks for having me, Danielle. Yeah, you're very welcome. Were you on the water or in the water this morning yourself? Not this morning. Um, I've taken the day off with a very strong west northwesterly. Um, it's pretty horrible out there for most of the Bayside beaches, with the exception of Mentone. So I'll go there a bit later. Yeah. Does it tend to it will maybe settle down in the afternoon? Uh, it's forecast to, but even tomorrow, it's still not exactly a great day uh, forecast. A bit of rain. Um, but a southwesterly tomorrow makes it more likely that we can get back to Half Moon Bay. Yeah, so. okay. A bit protected. Yeah, so for everyone listening, you're sort of based around Port Phillip Bay um, in Melbourne. And where do you do most of what, what beaches do you do most of your training and coaching at? Um, our, our main focus and reach at the moment is with uh, Half Moon Bay and um, uh, Mentone. So, you know, we're, we're very blessed here to have um, uh, two beaches that can cater for most of the wind variations. So yeah. anything um, south, southerly or Eastly is good for everywhere, but uh, southerly or even with a bit of westerly, you know, Half Moon Bay is good. Uh, yeah. Anything northerly and and once again eastly everywhere, but um, uh, Mentone is best. So, so yeah. we always seem to have a, a beach to choose from. That's really that's really good. I've noticed um, on a few of the uh, Facebook sites, people have been saying there's been a lot of um, lion's mane jellyfish around. Do they come in with the wind and then? Or is that they do, yeah, and they seem to come in on the wind and then can disappear just as quickly. Right. Um, but we've, we've uh, had, last year they came in for a very short period of time and then disappeared for the whole of the summer. So I suppose we're hoping for the same uh, this year. I know that uh, people in Williamstown posted up a bit two days ago um, a very thick group of lion's manes. And so, yeah, we're... Yeah, we don't want to see that happen uh, no. <laughs> over the whole summer. No. Yeah, out of lockdown into another lockdown. <laughs> yes, yeah, that puts a lot of people off, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> well, it certainly does. It puts a lot of people off and we don't want to, with so many people coming into open water swimming, we don't want to ruin their experience. Yeah, absolutely. How did you end up as an open water um, coach? Like what led you down that path? Um, well, primarily it was my... Uh, coaching first uh, was learning really um, getting involved in swimming more as a, an adult um, and not a lifetime swimmer. I was a lifetime sports person, but never a lifetime swimmer. And so um, once I got my coaching accreditation um, through uh, internationally, which is, uh, which I think was very beneficial for me. I learned with some people who I really um, have found to be terrific. Um, I then went into the Great Victorian Swim Series and it was just something that um, uh, even though the Portsea Classic wasn't a part of that, was the very first swim I ever did with some friends down in Portsea. And um, I just fell in love with open water swimming after that. And, once I'd done that, uh, the the choice between pool and open water to me was yeah, it was a no brainer. The open water one every single time, and and from there I discovered a lot of things. And um, uh, one, I could do my coaching in the open water. I was surprised at how many people really uh, thought that they could only swim in a pool and not really in the open water. And you know the, the my coaching passion started with transitioning people from the pool into open water. Yes. And then, you yes. know, like all things, um, uh, there's the pool swimmers who don't like the cold. And, and so it's just, it's just been a gradual thing, little baby steps. And the pandemic has really helped speed the process of transitioning more people out of the pool into open water. That's all it's really done. And people have surprised themselves um, about how well they have been able to cope with the cold because for a lot of people it's been two winters and 
you know, the number of people getting into the bay now, as opposed to say five or 10 years ago, is just it's chalk and cheese. Yeah. Well, what kind of things do you recommend for someone starting out with cold water swimming in the bay at the moment? Like what, what a, a newbie coming to, to try it out, what, what sort of basics do they have to have? One, you just want uh, having the curiosity to find out about what it's all about. And then, you know, just being, um, uh, taking advantage of the, not, the wealth of knowledge that's out there. You know, the, there's a lot of people that will help them uh, ease into the water, baby steps. And basically, um, my transitioning into cold water was, uh, uh, came as a result of uh, me writing a, um, a part of uh, my coaching accreditation on the international um, uh, on the international platform is I have to write articles every year to remain compliant. And, and one of the articles I wrote, which was probably about 10 years ago, is why do people um, become swim in the cold when there's a perfectly warm option called a wetsuit? And that was my article. And, and I'd been swimming in the cold uh, you know, in a wetsuit for a while. And I'm, I was just fascinated by all these people swimming without. And I thought, they're crazy. What are they doing? You know? so, <laughs> so I wrote this article about the luxuries and the creature comforts of swimming in a wetsuit. And to me, it sounded perfectly logical. And to a lot of people who said it, yeah, I'm with you, pal, and the whole thing. And then, but I caught a lot of criticism from on the International Coaching Forum about, was I aware of the benefits of cold water swimming and had I ever tried it? And you know the definition of, you know, you shouldn't knock it until you've tried it. So anyway, I took the plunge and tried it. And I, my response to that first was, no, I hadn't tried it, but I don't need to jump off a cliff to know that it's not good for me. <laughs> and uh, so um, anyway, I, I listened to... Uh, the wise words of some of our coaches in San Francisco and New York, and uh, and I took the plunge. Um, the, my first day, I'll never forget, it was in 12 degree water uh, at Half Moon Bay. Uh, I convinced three other people to go with me and try it. And uh, back in that day, there were different poles, but one of the poles that we swam to was about 450 metres from the boat ramp and I was about I remember swimming about halfway to that pole and just in my mind I just said oh my god I've jumped off that cliff and now I'm going to die <laughs> and uh, that was my first reaction the brain freeze everything really got to me and anyway I really didn't think I was going to survive but anyway I got to the yellow pole and then came back uh, to the start and all of a sudden, I was feeling great. And so two of us, two of the two never went back into cold water again without a wetsuit. And two of us then continued to swim around the service and came back and have never worn a wetsuit since. So wow. um, it was really quite um, a life-changing event for me. And that's, I suppose, sparked the journey to learning and and understanding and then helping others to do the same. So um, you know, basically that's really from my perspective in from a coaching perspective is to you know, try and fast track the learnings of others so they don't have to go through all of the processes I've gone through. And, uh, yeah. and that's the way I try to approach it. That really interesting. You said when you you first you first got in with that first cold water um, experience, and you had the face freeze, the brain freeze, and then you were coming back and it, it tipped over. Was that a tipped over into you thinking it was wonderful? Was that a physical response, or did you go through something uh, mentally to click over, or how did that become um, sort of a euphoric well, feeling for you? Well, I think the body um, all of a sudden wasn't hurting so much and my brain freeze uh, started to dissipate, but it was more, I think the, the actual joy, the, the feel of the water was so totally different. And 
and you know the feeling of the water on your hands and the face and on your chest and on your legs it was just you just had a much better feel for the water and um and i then started to think wow the water is actually thicker when it's colder as well so uh the messages are quite you know the water is always talking to us and letting us know whether we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing but when it's thicker like that the messages are even louder so the water is actually shouting at you saying no you idiot don't do it that way do it a different way and when you do you say oh thanks for that great tip and uh you know it's so that started to come through and it was more the fact that i was feeling uh there was this bit of euphoria and i think you know um it's that what drives people to continue doing cold water swimming when i got out um i've never felt so alive in all my life and uh, it was fantastic and uh, and i don't think even to this day, I don't think you ever see any group of swimmers if they put hand on heart and are honest with themselves, saying, gee, I love getting into cold water. You know, it's, I don't think anybody truly does that, but they know what, is, what the outcome is going to be. They know what they're going to feel like afterwards, and that's why we continue to do it. You know, there's days I look out there and go, oh, I'm not going out there. <laughs> and somebody else turns up and you say, no, oh, okay, then let's do it. Then you go in and say, oh, wow, wasn't that fantastic? The number of times I've said that is just too many to mention. And, yeah. You know, oh, glad I did that. You know, well, thanks for making it. I wouldn't have gone if you hadn't have turned up. If I could have coined, if I could bottle all those, the number of times I've heard that, there's just too many to, to mention. There's yeah. very few times uh, I've ever left the water and heard anybody who's also been in there saying, well, that's the last time I'm doing that. That was ridiculous. You know, I'm not going to do that <laughs> yeah. again. I've never really, I may have heard that once or twice. Yeah. And it's usually to do when people have had a bad jellyfish experience. Yes, yeah, of course. That puts people off, definitely. Yeah. I mean, obviously open water swimming has exploded during this time when we've been, obviously pools have been locked down and people are looking for their closest body of water to swim in, whether that's the bay or a river or a lake or whatever. Um, in normal times when we are able to swim um, anywhere we want and you've got squads going, how do you um, sort of structure that? I know you have a kayak that you swim beside your swimmers. How, how do you go with coaching them out there on the water? Give us a bit of a... Okay, so there's two forms of coaching and, and I'm really, it's, it's always, <clears throat> and maybe you can help me, you know, it's a case of, we've been trying to work out how to best describe uh, coaching. There's there's many different types of coaches, and, and I and I try to always um, come up with what's my point of difference. And 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 the thing is, is I'm not one of the normal coaches. I'm not like really a squad coach. So doing the squad coaching out on the open water has just evolved because people haven't been able to get into the pool. But there's many. Uh, squad coaches who really have a passion for that. And they, are, they are already conditioning people who want to really get swim fit and uh, working towards a specific uh, event and they really want to perform at their peak and, and so on. And, and for people to perform at their peak, it takes two, there's two parts to it. Just training isn't really, um, you know, just working on uh, interval training or, resistance training or just training harder isn't necessarily going to cut it that when you think about um, all elite sports people there's major there's two major components to it yes there's routine and volume and uh, speed and interval and strengthening exercises so speed work um, and that's really what the pools are when you're going to a pool squad session it's really about building up that aerobic capacity. But if you're looking at top sports people, they also spend an element, part of their week, every week working on uh, the process and the technique of doing that. And uh, you can't do that in a traditional squad session. You can't, anybody who says they can is probably 
kidding themselves. If you go to a squad and there's 30 people and they're getting you to do drills, you're not working on technique unless you're specifically really 100% focused on changing a part of your process. And that just doesn't happen in squad. You know, there's too many people, too many things happening and people are just worried about getting up to the other end of the pool before the others. You know, that's, kind of, uh, that's really what squad's about. When you're going, so you, I try to make sure that those sessions are never compromised. Working on technique must be a 100% focus on delivering a change to something you're doing. And you can't be in two minds when you do that. So it's really important if you want to, for instance, if um, uh, uh, the number of times people come in and say, oh, I don't need to have a lesson. And I'm saying, really? That's really interesting. Why do you say that? And I say, oh, no, I, I swim all the time. I swim, you know, five times a week. I've got six squads on. So, oh, so that's going to deliver all the changes you want. So you think fitness is really a problem. I say, yeah, yeah, I, yeah I'm a really good swimmer. I've been swimming for 20 years. I say, that's interesting. You know, Tiger Woods, if he said that you'd agree he's a good golfer, he just says, no, I don't need to practice. I'll just go out there and, you know, go in the competitions and win because I'm a top golfer. But, you know, why does he have his swing coach? Why does he have, you know, all of these top swimmers have got people working on every small part of their stroke all of the time. Mm. And it never ceases to amaze me how um, as you leave that elite level, people seem to think, no, 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 it's just volume and uh, of doing the same that's going to get a better result. So, so I'm really confused as to how I should best describe that. I personally like to describe myself as like a swim mechanic. I'm, the, uh, I'm in the performance team. I'm the person in the, in the um, um, if you've got the Formula One, uh, Formula One drivers, they go into the pits. I'm in the pits sort of working with people, fine tuning, tinkering with the engine, seeing, checking all the KPIs, what's working well, what's not working well, how can we deliver better performance? And then uh, telling the driver, you know, here's what I want you to do for the next 10 laps. You know, I want you to ease up, you know, speed into the turns or change your braking or whatever, you know, so, and that's going to get a better result and it's going to see a better um, outcome. So. Yeah, I don't know if that's uh, maybe a long-winded re response, but <laughs> but that's pretty much the way I'm thinking, and it's it's also been part of my frustration because people uh, just in the end they see swim swim coach, yeah, oh, you're a swim coach, yeah, and you know you've got you've got the young fifteen-year-old that coaches the school kids on a school um, holidays program, probably can't swim. That well themselves and they act swim coaches and then there's the swim coaches at the uh, Australian team level and then there's swim coaches that do five squads a week and that's all they ever do yeah and then yeah so with your so, open water swimmers you obviously do a lot of technique with them in the pool and then take them into the bay do you tend to do the technique work in the bay or is that mainly is that more just the the this, aerobic side of things in in the way i <clears throat> the pool side of working on it is really only a very short part when you say a lot i don't do a lot in the pool yep. with them. um it's really uh getting at least that first session out of the way um it's so the beauty about the pool is that they don't have to they're not distracted by other things and that is the waves the chop the water clarity, the um, anything else. So, yeah. what I the very first step we need to make with him changing anybody or working with anybody is they need to see themselves swimming. They need to know what it is that they're currently doing, and then I need to be able to show them how I would like them, the changes that I'd like to see them make, and the reasons why, and why if they um, do something different. You know, and uh, they will get a different result. Um, but I also uh, get them to experiment with what I ask them to do and, and uh, feel for it. Because the important thing is, is that, you know, uh, 
uh, the num there's quite a number of times people say, watch, watch what I'm doing. Is that better? Is that better? And I'm saying, okay, you tell me, was it better? You know, if, you, if it's working for you, the water will tell you, you know, did you go further? When you tried the other thing, what felt better? What went, what did you feel you went further? Did you feel you moved through the water? That, you know, it, it shouldn't be me telling people the, the water will give the response. And, and that's really important. So my uh, main task is to educate swimmers on what it is they should be looking for and what they should be feeling and, and how do they know if they're doing better or not. And, um, and, you know, so how will they know when they've improved? And what is, a, what is a good maintenance program over any given year? And just work with them. You know, my goal is never uh, to uh, work with a small number of people for many, many years. That's not what I do. My goal is the, the less amount of time I need to work with a person, uh, the less time I see them, uh, the better I'm doing my job is my thought. So you find so, with your athletes, they, they pop in for a bit of technique work and, and then they'll go off and do that. They might come back for a bit of fine tuning, that kind of thing. Yeah, what I like to leave people with is a clear set of, uh, a clear idea of what it is that they want to change and what that should look like. So... Yeah. Um, in the first year, it might be that I see them three or four times in a year. The second year might be twice, and then it might be once a year for their own after. So, yeah. um, and people are saying, I've been working on this. I want to really see that I'm doing that now. And when they do the videos, they say, oh, okay, good, good. What it, now, yeah. what am I going to focus on for the next year? Yeah. Right? Because... Um, the, the more you swim and the more uh, improved your technique becomes, um, the longer it's going to take to implement another change. And, uh, and people say, well, sure, certainly, surely it comes a time where you don't need to do it. Yeah, I'm sure there are. There is. You know, once people are just satisfied to uh, say, you know, like a tennis player, I'm playing a reasonable game of tennis and I'm happy with that and I... I'm quite happy. I'll just go along with that. Why? Just keep doing that if that's what makes you happy. But you got people like Michael Phelps today is still working and working with Bob Bowman, you know, one of the top coaches in the world. And he's still working daily because he knows he can still improve. He's not happy with where he's at. He knows he's not going to go faster. And, and, and uh, improvement's not measured by the time on the clock improvement in efficiency is a feeling it's it's knowing that my god it can't get any better than this yeah but i'll just double check i'll go and check on something i'll work on something else and then i'll come back in a year's time and see if i can put hand on heart and say that i'm not doing better my own personal experience has been i i would probably have thought that where I was swimming, I felt really good when I was into doing the uh, competition swims and great Victorian swim series. And then my coaching really took off more along uh, the coaching terms. But the beauty of my coaching is that every time I work with somebody, I'm learning something as well. Uh, that everybody does something a little bit different and I need to problem solve and, uh, and work with them to fix that and I'm saying oh, that's really good then I try and um, what I um, uh, like about what I can do is I can imitate other people's strokes so I can whatever no matter how bad a stroke is I can I can copy that and then I try and work on how to fix that and so when I see something done by uh, a swimmer in the water I try to replicate what I'm seeing and see what it feels like and then I can better describe how to the road or the, the road map out of that. Yeah, <laughs> to okay. <laughs> to take a quote that we're yeah, using. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> topical phrase. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. the road map yep. to anywhere is different. If you go down to, and I'm sure most people will identify with this, if you go down to the bay on any given day and you see the number of swimmers swimming out, and it's 
there's enormous numbers and they're um they're all doing freestyle and yeah. it's amazing where you say my god have a look at that they're all doing the same stroke but it's, that the miles will be all the languages of the world yes you know they can it might be freestyle and ours but it's my god there's so many different ways of doing freestyle and um and that's really what we want is to say okay well who are the best uh you know uh you know when you look at the olympics then the variations narrow quite dramatically there is mm. you know more strokes looking more alike so we do know that okay what we need to do to improve is to start looking more like what they are looking like and that doesn't mean you have to go to them to find out because a lot of those swimmers have just been molded into that by their coaches who are working on their technique so yeah. really what you got to do is say not become them themselves mm. but what is it that they're practicing and how do they do it and what is their focus and that's probably what I should be doing more of than um, than what I'm doing now yeah, if you look at an Olympian if you yeah. look at an Olympian in their whole uh, swimming week they they train sometimes up to 16 sessions a, a week in the pool mm. they'll cover between 60 and 70 kilometers so therefore you know for me to expect to swim like them there's what's the gap and I'm yep. going to say it's enormous. Yes. Right? Then we look at the physical attributes. And you know, I'm exactly the same height as Michael Phelps, but that's where the similarities begin and end. <laughs> His wingspan is 10 centimetres, much longer, wider than mine. His, uh, um, his torso is longer than mine. Mine's fairly long. And his feet are uh, four sizes bigger than mine. His hands are about two centimeters longer on most fingers than mine yeah. and you think okay um doesn't matter what i do i will never have the same physical attributes as him yeah i don't certainly not willing to train as hard as he does and <laughs> as often yeah. and uh, so therefore it's unrealistic for me to want the same outcome and yeah. so um but uh, what um, I suppose what I'm leading to is that then look at the work of the makeup of those 16 sessions. Michael Phelps spent 80% of his time working on, uh, or 75% of his time at least, working on micromanaging every part of the stroke, whether that be the push offs, the streamlining, the, it's all done at about uh, what he would call swimming slow to swim fast. It's all done at feeling every single movement of the elbow, of the fingers, of the hand, the wrist, the feet, everything. And then, um, then the next 15% of his week was work just at aerobic capacity, working just below what he would call his critical limitations. And then the remaining 10% is working at harder than what he knows he can physically hold the process. So he's trying to stretch that and then and a combination of the other two uh, build up what he, his uh, critical limitation level so that yeah. his tolerance level and his ability is stretched that little bit further. So. Yeah. Just back to what you said, an interesting thing. Um, do you see a difference between freestyle that you would swim in a pool to freestyle in the open water? Can it be the same? What, what differences or what changes can people or do they need to make when we have to take into account waves and different sort of water in both of those um, different bodies of water, the pool to the, the bay? Really good question. And, uh, and it's something that a lot of people, you're going to hear a whole myriad of responses. But let's just say you take a day where the water is like glass mm. and, uh, and, and you're thinking, okay, it's probably better than being in lane three in any given pool where the pool is rougher than what the open water is on some of those days where it's like a mirror. Um, the difference will be is in the pool, the thickness of the water, the water is usually warmed up to about um, you know, high 20s. 
uh, in a learn to swim pool, it's in the 30. So the swimming is usually done in 27, 28 degree water. Um, yep. And so when you hop into the bay, that water temperature can be anywhere between like this winter, eight and a half to, um, and not many people like swimming in that, uh, to, you know, but uh, can go all the way up to um, about 24 or 25 at the height of summer. So the water thickness is different. So there's a difference. So people can feel like they're swimming slower in the uh, bay than what they are in the pool. And they'd probably be right, you know, because um, a lot of people don't realize, but water doesn't go from what it is at 25 degrees to totally frozen at zero. There's a thickening process. And so the resistance in the water is greater. So I uh, really urge people to get into cold water swimming to really work on their technique. It's a great, um, it's a great time to work on it. Don't look at speed outcomes. Don't look at your watch and, and consistently say, oh God, I, you know, I'm slow today. You know, yeah. great yeah. is, you know, that's all that they're worried about. So, you know, um, they want all wanting to be the Tom Cruise, the need for speed. The stroke then is if you're swimming, I'm going to say, how difficult is it for people to really focus on swimming one way, you know, uh, let alone all of a sudden, it's about as challenging to go out there and start thinking, okay, I'm an open water swimmer. So therefore I need to know French, Italian, German, I don't know, name a whole heap of other um, Spanish, whatever. And it's not that simple. I'm not going to swim totally different. However, you experience will tell you what you need to do, like your recovery, classic recovery arm actions where the fingers might be just uh, in, you know, millimeters over the water. In a chop, that's probably not a wise thing to do. You want the you'll want to get the, uh, the uh, forearm and the swing, the recovery arm just up a little bit higher. When you're breathing, you'll need to make the adjustments to rotate just a fraction more than, than uh, what you might normally in order to get the air. You've still got to rotate, you've got to keep the head down. All of the same rules apply. And, um, but how you, uh, you make fine tune adjustments for the conditions. Once again, you sort of talk about, um, um, you know, I, well, I draw that um, uh, similarity between Formula One and swimming. So Formula One, you're going out and it's a nice hot day as opposed to a day where it's pelting down. You're gonna make tire, tire changes. You're going to, um, you're gonna drive a little bit differently the wheels, are, the engine's still the same. Everything's, and the wheels still go round and round, same as they do in swimming. Yeah. But you're yeah. going to make these fine, and your, your um, I, I would call it your tuning in needs to be heightened. You really need to be, uh, to make the, the difference. You're looking at the peaks and troughs of waves. Where can I really surge ahead when I'm going into the current? Oh, I get to the peak and I can actually slide down the back of that wave and come up the next part way up the next one. And it can be really great fun. That's what we do in wild water swimming. And then when I'm going with the waves, about the importance of keeping the feet up so that the waves are coming in underneath and pushing you forward. And, you know, it's not so much the kick, it's the position of the feet rather than the power of the kick that's going to get the, because our kick out in the ocean is, you know, not going to deliver other than it, all it's going to do is burn fuel. But careful positioning of the feet can really take advantage of what yeah. Mother Nature is throwing at us. Yeah. If so, I... yeah, the answer is the short answer is there's really no change, but there's a heightened awareness and slight adjustments. Yeah. And obviously with sighting in the, it's a lot more um, important in the open water. What kind of advice would you give to someone just starting out and um, figuring out the best way for them to sight? So I know personally when I'm in the open water, I, I 
try to incorporate it with my um, my breath, and I probably do it every four to eight strokes. What's sort of the sweet spot you found? Okay, so uh, another really topic uh, and great question. Um, sighting is impacted by you know the direction of the currents and so on, and also person stroke. So people who cross over a lot will either and breathe primarily to one side will tend to have like a, um, either a slice, a slicing action where they'll go just, they always swim off to the left or they always swim off to the right. Yeah. Um, and the um, uh, one of the things I do with uh, the introduction to open water swimmers is I might have a group of 10 and we'll swim from one yellow cone to the next yellow cone, it's a hundred meters. I'd get them to black out their goggles. So we put black out in them and so they can't see anything. And we get them all to take 100 strokes and uh, set off in the right direction and just see where they wind up. And in a group of 10, you'll find that they could be spread anywhere up to 60 metres apart, left or right. Very few people go dead straight. And uh, if you take 100 strokes, you should travel and something that people should take into account every time they move their arm around you know, what are they expecting? I'm going to tell people that's another little tip is that every time you take one stroke, you should travel at least one metre, right? So if you're taking, you know, 100 metres between two um, uh, cones, it's a really interesting test. How close did I get to where I'm going? And, uh, and how straight did I go? So if you take 100 strokes, very rarely do people go dead straight. Uh, people will go off to the left and off to the right, and you can actually see how far you will have to swim extra in distance in order to get to your destination. So um, some people have actually been done a full circle and swimming the opposite way, believe it or not, uh, in, in thinking that they're swimming dead straight. Um, so I always start off with, in teaching, six strokes first, Right. And just see if you're going straight. Every time you turn a marker in a swim race, six strokes first. Am I still going straight? If I am still going straight, uh, go out to 10 and then to 12. And then you might, until you start going offline, then you make sure that you're sighting every time. If you start, as soon as you go offline, reduce the number of strokes between sighting. When you actually see some of the um, elites in um triathlon and that a lot of those people are sighting all the time you know yeah. and and that's probably and that's probably overkill lifting that head up is is hard work and it's certainly slowing the action down the swimming itself has changed into there's been a lot of different techniques on sighting and the, the best thing is to have the eyes just above the water in calm conditions that can happen in rough conditions, learning how to sight at the peak of the wave, not wasting your time trying to sight down in the trough because you're not, all you're going to see is water coming at you. So, you know, sighting on the peaks, making sure you don't lift the head too high. They have changed from getting a breath on that stroke to never breathing on the same stroke as a sighting one because it takes too long. Uh, so you breathe, you sight on one stroke and then breathe on the very next stroke and keep the head down. It's, um, uh, some people can experiment with that. It's all about what delivers the best result. But the more you look up, the more you sight, and the more you breathe, the, um, yeah, the, the slower you're going to go. You know, and, that's, and I always say to people, there's a reason why the 50 meter sprints, nobody breathes anymore. If you breathe in a 50 meter sprinting race, you're really not in the race. Uh, it's only one breath is enough to lose you the race. Yes. So, um, um, so we want to sight and breathe as little as possible and get the head back down as soon as you possibly can. Yeah, that's that's great advice. And say someone who's just come to open water swimming in the last bit of time during COVID and is interested in doing an ocean race, sort of something maybe like a one of the Victorian um, swim series, yeah. so 1.2K, what kind yep. of open water training would you be recommending? Like what, what would be a session that they could do in the water to help them towards that goal? What would you suggest? 
Um, I think just frequency of getting into the water, get into the water in various conditions, mm -hmm. just increase your distances. You know, there's, um, you'll find that, you know, we, uh, there are some different squads. We, we do run open water squads now where people can come in and they really can um, work hard in the open water, combine pool, uh, you know, combination of pool and open water swims. If you're really wanting to get into the open water and make that comfortable, it should be a part of your weekly training. Mm. You know, it shouldn't all be in the pool and then you turn up on the day and wonder why, you know, oh, gee, I'm really not comfortable in the open water. Well, get comfortable. Yeah. You know? yeah. Do it's, you do sort of things like, um, do you do interval training in those um, open absolutely. water? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. very yeah. much so. We, You know, gearing and pacing is, uh, probably the most single most important thing when you do the swimming that we do, which is, you know, open water, there's open water swimming, but then, you know, you know, our crowd is very much into marathon swimming. And, you know, um, marathon swimming isn't just the souped up version of a 1.2K swimmer, right? It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's really just training and pacing and knowledge. And understanding that, you know, each and every, you know, the number of people, once upon a time, uh, the number of people swimming the English Channel were uh, front page news every time somebody accomplished it. And mm -hmm. now, uh, with knowledge and with the, um, and, and, you know, right around the globe, you know, the open water swimming phenomenon hasn't just been in Melbourne or in Australia. Um, if you really want to see what it's done around the world, it's just enormous. And in fact, if you look at it, Australia has really fallen behind in the world of open water swimming. When you look at our performances in the pool, you know, just compare them to our results in open water swimming, in marathon swimming around the world, and we are really falling off the perch. And you know, we we and I'm just going to really encourage the movement into open water, you know. So yeah. uh, there's no surprise to me to see that, you know, we do well in the pool because we spend most of our time in the pool. And, um, but COVID has really, and the lockdown has really, uh, I think, got people at least interested in saying, hey, if I can do that. I didn't mind it actually out there in the open. Well, there are a lot of people who I've heard who are saying, gee, that's really cool. And I'd say that as soon as the pool's open, just at least keep one or two sessions a week. If you're serious about doing well in open water swimming or in triathlon, you can't do better than, yeah, a bit of a mix. You know, we've got the great sessions with, you know, all the masters clubs around, the, uh, uh, around Melbourne. Um, and we've got, you know, great coaches in, you know, experienced coaches in, say, Johnny Van and, um, and Robert Butcher and others and who do great sessions at the pools that, uh, you know, that uh, help people prepare for specific pro, uh, events, um, but then come out into the open water, really uh, do some of those, those you know, Training in open water is is important. You don't want to come out and just do your training in the event that you're selected event, and then be disappointed with the result. You know, um, the result you get in your event should come as no surprise to anybody. You know, it can be, oh, gee, I really stuffed up, but it shouldn't be a surprise. And you should know exactly uh, what you, looking at the conditions, you know understand what you should realistically expect on any given swim. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I, I know um, when we were talking um, before the podcast, you mentioned a new initiative that you were trying to get up and running with helping swimmers around Australia and possibly around the world connect with different places to swim at. So if you arrive at a beach, a brand new beach, when you're on holiday, for instance, how do you find out what the conditions are there, who to swim with, where to contact? Tell us a little bit about that initiative that you're trying to get up and running. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, that's uh, as a result of the Bay Open Water Swimmers Group um, that we have on Facebook. I know that there are not not everybody's on Facebook uh, and not everybody's a fan of Facebook. So we are um, uh, building a website that will uh, um, be, you know, so we'll have both Facebook and a proper web uh, page that people can go to. Um, and one where we'll have um, a lot of experienced people sharing lots of advice and uh, stories. Uh, there'll be forums where people can throw their questions up and find out, you know, some of the interesting topics you've already uh, raised. You know, you'll hear other people talking about it. You'll hear, uh, see posts by experienced swimmers of all levels, triple crown swimmers, English channel swimmers, uh, just, uh, you know, peer to pub, peer to Perignon swimmers as well, you know, that will share their stories. But we will be um, getting uh, the Bay Open Water Swimmers is now becoming an incorporated group and will become like, a, um, a, a, I'm hoping, like an association body for open water swimmers, uh, not only here in Melbourne, but we'll connect with other groups in other states so that people are going on a holiday, they want to put up, they, they're going to a specific location, whether that be Jarvis Bay or up on the Sunshine Coast at Mooloola Bar, you know, what, what swimming groups are there? When do they swim? How often do they go? Do they welcome newcomers? Uh, all of that. So we'll be putting all of that information and that'll be built up over the next six to nine months. Yeah, that's great. It's a wonderful initiative because, I mean, I, I think a lot of swimmers have their group or their squad that they swim with and then go away and find that they don't have anyone to swim with. And that's when they've actually got time to do more swimming when they're on holidays. So that's a, that's a really good initiative that I think people will really take it, take it up and find it really yeah. valuable. So that's yeah, a great idea. And, and I think, you know, the, they'll find that, um, you know, having a swimming buddy has lifelong rewards and, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I think, you know, the number of people, the number of people who I've seen build up big groups over this COVID uh, period has been enormous. You know, the, we had a, a massive group down there at Half Moon Bay and Men's Home with the pink caps and all that. We built up very big groups. But because of the COVID restrictions, it's meant that we've had to have splinter groups. And the beauty is, is that, you know, in amongst that, we've seen... Um, enough people willing to be the leader of that and to be, you know, start up a group. And, and all it takes is for somebody to say, oh, you know, let's get a little WhatsApp and we'll put that in. And oh, if you want to know when we swim, we'll put you out our, to our group. And those groups, I've seen some of them grow from two to three to 35, 40. It's fantastic. Yeah. 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 So there's... Uh, but we want people to know that there's always a place to find a swimming buddy and we urge you to do that rather than just swimming alone. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose final point I wanted to ask, do you advocate, even though you you do it without wetsuits, um, one of the little toe uh, floaty boys behind you, do you swim with those or do you get all your squad members to swim with those, the visibility? Um, in squad uh, we don't because we've actually got a paddler there uh, alongside and, you know, we, we don't um, add to um, any drag factor. In learning introduction to open water swimming, yes, I will use those at, at all times. One, whether it be as a, uh, you know, just a added bit of, I don't know, confidence for the swimmer swimming, even though you don't ever really use it for a life-saving device, it's it's amazing how it's sort of like saying, "Well, okay, we'll take the the blankie with us, and <laughs> you know, on the until such point in time as we don't." But once we go out past um, the poles, and people when they go to open water swimming areas must know where the swimming area is and where the shared water area is. It's point. A, 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 um, a, a big believer in educating people on, you know, water safety, same as road safety. You wouldn't dream of going out on the road on a bike without a helmet. And yet we have people out in the water running all over the road, right where all the boats are, right where all the jet skis go and 
think that I've got right away. Good luck with that. You know? so, the, so having, we have a duty of care, even if it's not a tow float, to be wearing something bright and uh, something that stands out. Um, pink and orange and yellows and those lime greens really do stand out. And we, we've got to make ourselves visible. Um, the tow floats were primarily, I uh, brought those in primarily uh, for that. And a lot of people think, oh, I don't need one of those. No, we, <laughs> you don't need a helmet to ride on the road either. It's just common sense, though, for safety. That's what it's about. Yes. And a lot of people think that it's uh, something here in Australia. Uh, let me assure you, over in Europe, um, and, and it's not something that serious swimmers are doing. In open water swims over in Europe and Spain, you don't wear one, you don't swim. Simple as that, right? It's compulsory. You, your timing device is going to be in them, and if you don't wear one, so it's not a, it's not a macho thing. It's not a uh, safety thing. It's, well, sorry, it's, it's not a personal uh, life jacket, it's, but it is a safety thing for, yeah. you know, they stand out and everybody who's on the cast will, they see them everywhere anyway. Yes. But more importantly, they're really handy. I put my, um, I double bag and I put my phone, wallet and keys in there. And it's, uh, and that's why I call them the swim well swim safes is that it's like this little safe that you take along with you, with your valuables in. Yeah, yeah, that's got that added bonus, hasn't it? I think visibility first and foremost, and obviously a little safe to go along with you. <laughs> Well, another little thing that I'd use them for is um, we have ones where you can put all the feeds in for our uh, marathon swimming. So it takes along our feed and um, everything else. So, but everybody loves swimming with the current. And in summer, when you've got a raging current going one way, how good is it when you can say, okay, I'm going to put my shorts, thongs, t shirt, and all that in there and uh, my wallet so I can get a nice little coffee afterwards on the phone um, and I'm going to swim with it and then walk all the way back yeah and uh, you know I don't have to record on my Garmin uh, my slower time coming back into the current you know yeah. we can all be uh, so yeah I swam at a, uh, you know, <laughs> a 110 pace for the whole 10k yeah <laughs> That'd be nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Peter. It's been lovely chatting to you and hearing um, some tips and getting some advice on open water swimming. And um, hopefully things are opening back up for everyone soon and you'll get more people down swimming with you and your squads. Absolutely. And if people want to get involved or they, they don't know how to get involved, um, we will be starting up the introduction to open water sessions starting soon so fantastic um, you know we'll have those posted up on the swim well website so if anybody knows of anybody who wants to get involved hey there's a place for them to do so yeah fabulous okay we'll take care and we'll see you out on the water soon we'll do thanks danielle okay. bye bye